Uh, so we, we spent a little bit of time yesterday looking at uh, the website. This is Dorje Gurun, a friend of Mr. McKiernan's, and he's going to tell you and share some information about himself. And then at the end, we'll have some questions. As was already mentioned, I'm friends. I'm friends with uh, Mr. Gonzalez. How many of you know Mr. Gonzalez? Okay, good, good. Mr. Gonzalez and I, we went to school together in Italy. Okay, we'll come back to that later. Oh, okay. I see, okay. I see, okay. McKiernan, okay. Of course, for me, he's something else. But anyway, um, so I need to thank him for arranging this. I'm here because of him. He arranged this, okay, all of this. Um, now, before I actually start the presentation, I've got a few questions for you, all right? And I, I actually, I, I, I do this because I'm a teacher myself. I come from a teaching background. I stopped teaching about two years ago, okay? But because I'm a teacher and I have teaching backgrounds, I will be making this a little more of an interactive presentation than me up here just talking to you, okay? So, we'll start with some questions, All right? So, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? Raise your hand, share with the class. Okay. An athlete. An athlete. What kind of athlete? Any specific sport that you like? Uh, soccer or baseball. Soccer or baseball. Okay. I hear soccer is like the fastest growing sport in the U.S. Is that true? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. And you're hoping that one day it will become as popular as football? And make a lot of money. Become an athlete. Yes? Uh, an astronaut. Astronaut. Wow. Why? Uh, I like learning of stuff about space. Uh -huh. Zero gravity. Right. And where would you like to go if you become an astronaut? Mars. Mars. Okay. Did you see the Martian? Yeah. Yeah? What did you think of it? It was good. It was, was good? Yeah. I like when yeah. they landed. Probe there. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. I found it a little too long. Yes. Yeah. It was fun. Okay. <laughs> right, you. Oh, I want to be a psychiatrist or a therapist. A psychiatrist or a therapist. Why? I'm very interested in how like, the mind works. <coughs> mm-hmm. And you know, we still don't know how it actually works, most of it. We're still finding out about the way our mind works. Still. There's still a lot of mystery about how our brain works. Yes? An inventor. An inventor. Do you know what you would like to invent? I know that's a <laughs> stupid question, but... Stuff. Like what? Like a robot. A robot, okay. Machines. Machines, robots. To do what? To help the world. To help the world, okay. Fair enough. I mean, if you knew now, you'd be doing that, wouldn't you? Others? Others, yes? Marine biologist. A marine biologist. Wow, okay, that's very specific. Why? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> just like the mind, just like the mind, just like the brain, the sea is a vast unknown, right? There's so much we don't know about what's in the sea, still. Right? Others. Girls, ladies, a surgeon, a surgeon, like a one who does surgery. All right. Anything specific? Nerve system. Okay. Why? Okay. So you're also interested in. Okay. 
Interested in brains, how it works, and you want to help people. Okay. Others. Others. This table here, this corner. Yes? I want to become a mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer. Why? Because I like designing and creating things that benefit other people in the world. Okay. Fantastic. I want to become a veterinarian. Veterinarian. Okay. Why? Because I love pets. You love pets. How many pets do you have? Two. Two. Okay. What are they? A husky and a poodle mix with a German Shepherd. Okay. So you're a dog person. Me too. I don't like cats. I mean, they're okay, but... Yeah. Dogs, of course. Right. Okay, hold on. Uh, this went off again. Let me do this so that it doesn't turn off. Come on. Hold on just a second. I'm just noticing that this is switching off by itself. Uh, uh, where is it? Okay. All right. Um, that's not the end of my questions. I still have more questions for you guys. All right. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if your parents never went to school or did not graduate from school. Didn't go to school or secondary school, high school, or did not graduate. Okay. So that's most of it. Okay. Put your hands down. Let's see, let's see your hand if your parents graduated from high school. One of them. Oh, okay, one or both. One or both. Okay. All right. Good. That's okay. All right. Hands down. Raise your hand if one of your parents or both your parents graduated from college. One, two, three, four. Okay. All right, a small number. Okay. Um, and raise your hand if you were not expected to go to school, like elementary school. Okay. One person. But the rest of you, the rest of you, you're expected to go to school. Raise your hand if you were not expected to graduate from primary school, elementary school, but you did. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. So you were all expected to graduate, Shh. graduate from elementary school, and you did. All right. Now you're in secondary school, or as you call, as you call them here in the U.S., uh, middle school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're not expected to graduate from middle school. If your parents, your community really doesn't expect you to finish middle school, raise your hand. Okay, all right. Raise your hand if you're not expected to finish high school. Okay, wow, all right. So you're all expected to finish high school. Raise your hand there's, if there's no expectation for you to go on to college. Okay, all right, okay. So you're all expected to go to college. Yes. Are you expected to graduate from college? Yes. And do you hope to go to college? Yes. And graduate from college? Yes. Okay, all right. What that means, what that tells me is that you're actually in a much better position than I am or that I was when I was your age. Okay? I was not expected to even go to school. Forget about high school. Forget about middle school. Forget about high school. Forget about college. Forget about what I've done since then, where I've been, and where I am today, here, talking to you. Forget about all of this. 
But I managed, I somehow managed to do all of this because I started dreaming of accomplishing more than what I was expected to accomplish. Okay? Because I followed my dreams. And that is what this presentation is going to be all about. About how I follow my dreams and how, hopefully, you might be able to take some lessons from my life. Right? So that you could also achieve some of the things I have achieved. So that you can have the kind of experience that I've had about this planet we live in and the people we share this planet with. All right? Okay. So, you all know I'm from Nepal. Yes. Oh, well, before that. Um, if at any point you have a question or a question about anything I put up there or a question about anything I say, or if you need clarification on anything that I say or that I put up there, or if you're just curious about something I say or something that I put up there, just raise your hand, okay? And then you can ask, all right? All right, so going back to where I left off about me being from Nepal. What do you know about Nepal? Raise your hand. What do you know about Nepal? Yes? South Asia? Uh, not quite. Um, we call it, not quite, I mean, okay, in general it's south, but it's more specific, we've got a term for it, a little more specific term for that. Does anyone know? The nope. subcontinent. Okay, yes. Um, low caste? What about low caste? Low caste, Nepal, something like that. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm asking you about Nepal. What do you know about Nepal? Yes. Thank you. There was a huge earthquake. Do you remember when it was? Yes. Yes. April. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's near the Himalayas. Yes, near the Himalayas. As a matter of fact, the Himalaya, part of the Himalaya, goes right through it. Okay. What else do you know about Nepal? Where is it? Southeast Asia, the subcontinent. Where more specifically? Does anyone remember or know? Yeah, where is it? Where is Nepal specifically? Tell me the neighboring countries. India and and China. All right? Someone mentioned it here. Right. All right. India and China. Right. Bhutan is farther east. Yeah. India to the south. And China, Tibet to the north. And I come from this little area within the circle. All right? um, the mountains, Himalaya, run all across from east, uh, from the west to the east, and then beyond. Of course, it continues on west. And I'm sure you've heard of. Everest. Yes. What is Mount Everest? It's the tallest mountain in the world. Where is it? Europe. Border of India and China? Let me give you a hint. I'm asking you. It's in Nepal. Right there. Okay? It's in Nepal. And so, in that little, I come from my village, where my family comes from, where my parents come from, is within that little area um, inside the blue circle. All right? And that area is called Mushtang. And because it's along the Nepal Tibet border, that area geographically and culturally is also Tibet. So I am a Tibetan. I'm a Nepalese national, but a Tibetan by ethnicity. Okay? Like you guys, a lot of you are of Mexican heritage or some other Central American heritage, but you're a ne 
American national because you were born here or because your parents were born here, right? Okay. And within this little area, the place I come from, the village my family comes from is called Tangbe. Right? And because this is highland desert, it's really, really dry. Can you tell? Yep. Yeah? Very little vegetation. Right? Very little vegetation. And this little village is where I lived the first five, six years of my life with my grandparents as a child. And of course, because it's in such a remote area, we didn't have schools, we didn't have hospitals, right? We had no indoor plumbing, no running hot and cold water in the house, no TV, no roads, no cars, no phones, right? None of that. And so most of the people from my village, including my parents, grandparents, and other relatives, most of them never even went to school. And also because we came from such a remote area, most of the people from the village were poor, like my family. Plus, because we're ethnic Tibetans in a Hindu country, we were considered to be a low caste, essentially a low class people. Okay? And so, the society in Nepal did not expect me to go to school and become successful. But my parents, who lived in another city, okay, um, a city south of this village, my dad wanted me to come down to the city and he wanted to send me to school so that I would be able to learn to read and write. Because he hadn't been to school, because no one from my family had been to school. He wanted to, me to be able to learn to read and write so that he felt, so that I would have a little more opportunities than he did. So, my grandfather finally agreed to take me down to the city and I ended up attending these government schools, what, we, what you in the U.S. call public schools. All right? And this was the third public school that I attended, the third elementary school I attended. What do you notice about the school? It's very small, thank you. And? Um, very little rooms. Very little rooms, yeah. Isolated. Yes? Isolated. Um, it was actually in the city. In that sense, not isolated. What else do you notice? No playground. No playground. All right. No playground. We didn't have uh, resources. We didn't have much of a resources. Like these, for example, could pass for our classrooms. And these are actually pictures of classrooms at schools that my organization works. And I'll come to that later. All right? So, and it was at this school. It was at this school that a teacher of mine, seeing promise, seeing potential in me, took my dad aside and told him, look, your son has potential, but if you leave him here, nothing will become of his potential. Take him to Kathmandu, and Kathmandu is the capital city of Nepal. Take him to Kathmandu, put him in a good school. My dad, who didn't know anything about education, agreed to take me to Kathmandu and 
put me in a good school. He went around asking friends about schools in Kathmandu and I ended up at this school. All right. This is a Jesuit school. It's outside of Kathmandu city, but within the valley of Kathmandu. And because it was a Jesuit school, it was subsidized by the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. And so we had quite a lot of resources. Like, for example, a library. We had a library. That was a major resource in Nepal at the time. Most schools didn't have libraries. As you saw, public schools, look at that classroom. What does it have? Nothing. Nothing. The bare minimum, right? But this school had a lot of resources, such as a library. And this school also had some amazing teachers. North American teachers, American priests, Canadian teachers, right? And these teachers basically inspired me. And it was when I was in fifth grade, a 12-year-old boy, when I decided that I would come to the U.S. for further education and return to Nepal to help kids who were born into the kind of background that I was born into. Okay? It all started by this father, our fifth grade teacher, called Father Downing. It all started with him bringing former students who were visiting the school, bringing those students to the classroom to speak to us, the way I am speaking to you. These former students were either graduates of colleges in the U.S., or were in Nepal for vacation. There were students in the U.S. and had come to Nepal for vacation. So they'd come to us, come to our classroom, and speak to us about education in the U.S. And, that's, and those guys, those stories, basically inspired me to dream of coming to the U.S. for further studies. So two things. I dreamt of coming to the U.S. for further studies, and second dream was to then ultimately return to Nepal to help kids who were born into the kind of context I was born into. And so, in order to realize the, this dream, what I did was study. Devote a lot of my time to my studies. I was motivated to do well in school, and I also read voraciously. Of course, as you probably know, English is not our native language in Nepal. Nepali is our native language. <coughs> and I had to, of course, be really good in English in order to get admission at schools in the U.S. And in order to do that, in order to improve my English, in order to become really good in English, I read books, All right? novels, a lot. And I was lucky because I went to this school. And apart from Father Downing, I had all of these other teachers, David Beeston, Brother Joe Sheehan, Rick Horas. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to see one of these teachers in a few days, Brother Joe Sheehan. He was our English teacher when I was in seventh grade. And you know what? He was such a good teacher. He inspired us so much that I still remember the stories that he told us. And he lives in Palm Springs, I discovered. And I'm going to visit him after... So that was 1983 that, I, that he taught us. So how many years has that been? 32. 32 years since he taught us. But he inspired us so much that I remembered him. And I remembered his stories. And when I, back in May, I tried to 
find out where he was. And I, sure enough, I tracked him down and I'm going to see him. So Brother Joe was another teacher who inspired me. And Rick Harass and Brother Paul Galantovich. He was our science teacher. He taught us science when we were in 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. And he inspired me so much with his science teaching that I did, he was a chemistry specialist. I did very well in chemistry. And as a matter of fact, I went on to major in chemistry at college in the U.S. And in addition to telling us amazing stories and doing amazing science experiments, they would also tell us about a different world outside of Nepal, of different people, of different cultures, right? Because they all came from outside of Nepal, from North America. And as a matter of fact, one of the teachers, David Beeston, a Canadian, I remember a phrase he kept repeating in the winter. He would walk in and he'd, he'd tell us a story about how he had an amazing experience doing this or that in the valley or outside the valley. And he would say, and you know, in Canada now, in the winter, in Winnipeg, when you look out the window, all you see is white. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> because in Kathmandu, it doesn't snow. And it doesn't snow here either, right? Nope. So, anyway, the point being that they inspired me to think of different cultures, different people, different places, right? And all the while, I'd been dreaming of, of course, coming to the U.S. for further studies. As I, when I was a secondary student, a middle school, high school student, I also discovered about another opportunity, the United World Colleges. And some of you, I'm sure, would also be interested in that at some point. These are schools around the world that give scholarships to students to attend those schools. There are 14 United World Colleges around the world, and there's one in the U.S. as well, in New Mexico. So American, um, they select... I'm quite certain it's 50. They select 50 American students every year to go to these schools on full scholarship. Okay? And there are 14 of them. And I learned about this. When I was a student, of course, there weren't 14. There were a few. I think there were only about, I'm trying to remember now, five or eight of them. So I heard about this. And I was, of course, again, intrigued and inspired to apply because I realized going to a United World College would be an opportunity to learn about other people and other places and other cultures. So I applied, and luckily for me, I got accepted. I won a scholarship to Italy, to the United World College of the Adriatic. Yes? What were the requirements to actually get in the scholarship or to have the requirements are that you have done well in academics and that you have a um, well-rounded background. Like, you must have been involved in extracurricular activities as well, in addition to doing well academically. Like, outside helping, and not just academics, but like sports. And sports, uh, community work, yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have to apply? Yes, you have to apply. And um, I th in the U.S., I think, I think there are different, what are called national committees. I think there must be a national committee in the West Coast and ma national committee, I'm sure, somewhere in the mountain region and Midwest and then East Coast. Yeah. Go online, um, uwc.org. There should be information there for Americans. Okay. Right. So I ended up here for two years. And this is where I met Mr. McKiernan. This is where we were students together. We overlapped a year. We were there 
the programs last for two years, and you apply, you go there for, as American students, you would go there during your last two years of high school, 11th and 12th grade, okay? That's when you would go there. And here's the other thing. If you get a scholarship to go to these schools, the chances that you'll get scholarships to go to American colleges and universities is really high. Because there's a program which provides funding to graduates of United World Colleges to something like 40 colleges in the U.S. Okay? So a scholarship to the UWC is pretty much a shoe-in for a scholarship to colleges in the U.S. And very good colleges, Ivy League colleges, Ivy League schools. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. So, I was there for two years. We were 200 students from, at the time, about 65 different countries. And I learned a lot about people from different cultures, people who practice different religions, people who practice different, who spoke different languages, people who had completely different ideas about the world from me. Okay? Learned about countries that I didn't even know existed. Learned about practices that I otherwise would have never come across had I stayed in Nepal. Learned about food. Developed taste for flavors that I didn't even know existed. Right? Pizza, for example. And American pizza is not what I'm thinking of when I say pizza. <laughs> See? You haven't tasted pizza until you've tasted Italian pizza. Okay? <laughs> and... It was here that I developed an interest in our world and the people, even more so than I had when I was in Nepal. It was more of an interest. Right? But, of course, I still dreamt of coming to, even while I was there, of course, I still dreamt of coming to the U.S. to study, for further studies. And I had, again, a full scholarship here. And while I was a second year here, I applied and got into Grinnell College in Iowa. Who knows where Iowa is? Yes. Where is it? Yes, it's in the United States, but where in the United States? The United States is huge. Where is it? Anyone else know while she's thinking? That's American, right? Yes. Iowa. That's, that's why it's in the United States. Iowa, Iowa. Hmm. Oh, I thought, I, I was thinking of Cuba. Yeah, I finished in Italy and then ended up here at Grinnell College in Iowa. Near, right, it's right on top, right on the bottom of Montana. That's actually uh, Minnesota. Oh, well, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the Midwest, where they have cornfields and hogs. The flatlands. A little different from Nepal. Okay. So, I was here for four years as an undergraduate student. And again, of course, I learned a great deal about American people, the U.S., and I had friends from around the world again. We, had, we were about 120, um, 130 international students, okay? And even while I was a student in Grinnell, Iowa, even while I was a student in Grinnell, Iowa, I actually went abroad. I went to the U.K. for six months to study as a student, all right? So all of these experiences, Italy, U.S., U.K., all of these experiences with different people, different cultures, religions, and so on, developed an interest in me for the rest of the world. And even though I'd come to the U.S. 
even though I had realized my dream of coming to the U.S. to study, and even though I, my goal had been to go back to Nepal after I got my degree, when I finished at Grinnell, well, at about the time I finished my time in Grinnell, I wasn't actually ready to go back to Nepal. And as a matter of fact, I remember spring of 1994, a friend of mine asking me, we were, having, we were sitting around having, I think we were having ice cream and watching the sunset. She, and I still remember, it was my friend Aubrey. She asked me, so, what do you want to do? And I told her, well, I want to go see the world. That was another dream that I had. But, you know, I had absolutely no idea how I would do that. I hadn't really thought through how I was going to do that. All right? But, it happened. I had a job offer from my old school in Italy to teach. And that started me on a 15 plus years of international teaching, of traveling and exploration. Those circled countries are all of the places that I worked from 1994 to 2013. That's 10 countries. From country, well, from United States in the west, all the way to Hong Kong in the east, and Norway in the north, to the little country of Malawi in the south, in Africa, and all of these other countries in between. And I also, of course, while working, teaching, I also had opportunities to travel. And I traveled to about three dozen different countries all over. And I made friends all over the world. And as a matter of fact, I've been traveling in the U.S. for almost eight months now. I started at the end of March. And you know what? Most of these eight months, apart from maybe ten days, apart from ten days, I spent all of my time with friends. Right? So eight months, eight times three, that's almost how many days? 200, 240 days. Out of 240 days, I spent 10 days in hotels, maybe. So 230 days I spent with friends. Right? An incredible privilege. And I've, I've been able to do that because I traveled, I worked in all of these countries. I was educated in all of these different countries. And as a matter of fact, I also went to Australia for education. I did my teacher training in Australia. So in, in doing all of that, I made friends from all over the world. And I made a lot of, many, a lot of friends. And those friends have hosted me, have wel welcomed me in their homes. All of these times I've been traveling, around the world, as well as the past eight months in the U.S. All right. And some interesting statistics. In the 25 years or so that I've been traveling around, I've been moving around, I've had about 27 residential addresses. And I lived in about 14 different countries, uh, cities, sorry. 14 different cities, 25 years, 27 different residences. And I did some amazing things like going on safaris, wildlife safaris in Nepal, in Tanzania, in the Serengeti Plains, the incredible Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. And I'm sure you've seen programs on National Geographic that were filmed in the Serengeti, right? And you know what you see on TV 
is nothing, is nowhere near as amazing as the real thing. Right? So Tanzania, Zambia, went on safaris in Zambia, went on safaris in Malawi, went skiing in Norway, in the U.S., in a country called Georgia. Does anyone know where Georgia is? Yes, the yeah. country of Georgia. I just heard there was a state. I know. <coughs> Georgia's like right here. Uh-huh. But there is a country called Georgia. And I went skiing there. Right? And I went hot air ballooning in Australia. And I went swimming with wild dolphins off the coast of Zanzibar. Yeah. And I learned to dance salsa, merengue. And I learned to play the, free, uh, the, the didgeridoo. Does anyone know what the yes. didgeridoo is? Yes, oh, yeah. that helps. It comes out in... Yes. Oh, yeah, did you hear that? It's a show. It's like a flute. It's like a flute. It's like... Yes? Has there ever been a time when you wanted to stay in one country? Oh, hold on. Just a second. So, uh, with, with the didgeridoo. It's like a flute, but it's long. But it doesn't have those holes for your fingers. It's long. Yeah? It's made of uh, eucalyptus yes. branches. Right. Now, going back to your question, have I ever wanted to live in one country? I'm still looking, I'm still searching for that country. I haven't found that yet. Still searching. Right. So while I was doing all of this, of course, while I was traveling, teaching, exploring, learning new things, learning about new cultures, new people, making new friends. While I was doing all of that, of course, at the back of my mind, I always knew I would be going back to Nepal at some point, right? That I would go home to help in the education of the next generation of Nepalese. And in March, 2013, a little over two years ago, I decided this is it. I'm done traveling. I'm done teaching. I'm going home to actually be a social worker and help the next generation of Nepalese. Right? At the time, I was in the little country of Qatar. Who knows where Qatar is? Or as they say, Qatar. Who knows where Qatar is? Any idea? Where is Qatar? Anyone? Yes? No? Huh. It's actually a country by itself. Hmm? Yes, somewhere in Asia. Yes. Where specifically? Asia is huge, huh? Okay, it's in the Middle East. It's in the Persian Gulf. It's a very small country. And it's very wealthy because they've got natural gas. So anyway, I was in Qatar at the time teaching at an international school. Unfortunately, I ended up taking a little detour. I had planned to return at the end of that year, so I would have returned home June 2013. But I ended up taking a small detour on May 1st, 2013, I was actually thrown in jail for allegedly insulting Islam. But after eight days inside the jail, a friend of mine in Qatar, an American friend of mine in Qatar, went to a journalist and had my story published. And that story got picked up by my friends all around the world, right? And my friends started a campaign, Free Dorje Gurun Campaign. Friends in Nepal, friends that I went to school with in Nepal, friends that I went to school with in Italy, friends that I went to school with in Grinnell College in Iowa, 
friends that I had worked with all over the world in ten, all of those ten different countries, right? Students, former students who I, th that I had taught around the world, former teachers of mine, they all started campaigns to get me released. And within four days, those campaigns, change.org campaign, Facebook campaigns, those campaigns got so big that the government, someone in the government of Qatar decided, this is not worth it. Let him go. So they released me after 12 days in jail, and I returned home on May 13. Right? Yes. When did you May 1st. Yes. Right. Um, what happened was three kids that I didn't even know, they basically, one of them went and told his dad something that I hadn't said. They'd been harassing me, we'd had an exchange, and he went and told his dad that I had said three things. The first thing they said I, I was supposed to have said was, all Muslims are terrorists. And then the second thing I'm supposed to have said was, Muslim terrorists blew up America. And the third thing, how old are you guys? Twelve. Twelve. Um, okay, I'll hold off on the third one. Okay? Anyway, but I'll tell you this much. The third thing I'm supposed to have said had nothing to do with Muslims or Islam. Okay? So, all right? I'll whisper in your ear later on. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So, anyway, instead of end of June, instead of returning home at the end of June 2013, I ended up returning home May 13, 2013. Okay? And I started working with a friend of mine and ran this nonprofit called Community Members Interested. What we do is help public schools. We've got two schools in Kathmandu and five schools in a little village northeast of Kathmandu, about 55, 60 miles northeast of Kathmandu. We help those schools with resources. As you saw, right, they have nothing. They're very little. So we help those schools with the resources. Infrastructure, right? We build bathrooms, buildings, right? We build libraries, computer labs, science labs. All right? And to give you an idea for what the school looks like, I've got a short video. But this video was made about more than two years ago to basically woo potential donors to my fundraising campaign. So it'll talk about, you know, um, needing help to get me past the tipping point, you know. That, that's a reference to the fundraising campaign, all right? I want to be a businessman. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. We're here in Sindhapalchuk at the school that you're supporting. You've just heard the dreams and aspirations of the students. But there's a huge gap between their dreams and reality. The reality is that the school doesn't have enough classrooms. For instance, this particular classroom, they have had to put two different classes together. And right now, there are over 50 students in here. The other issue, the other challenge here is the quality of teaching. Although the teachers themselves are highly committed, they lack experience and they lack training to help the 
the students realize their dreams. I'm incredibly grateful for the support that you provided me thus far. I need one final push to get us past the tipping point to help the children of Sindhapalchuk achieve their dreams. And we're helping this village. We're working in this area because the people in this area, just like my people from Mustang, are very marginalized. As you can see, right, they're very poor, so poor that they put their little girls to work. How old do you think this little girl is? Two, three, two, three, five, four. Yeah. However old she is, she's no older than five or seven, maybe. Right? And look at this little girl. Maybe slightly older. older. Maybe slightly, right? At most, nine, maybe? At most, you know? Yeah. I know you guys have difficulties reading their faces, but... Okay. Most of the people in this village are subsistence farmers. Meaning, what they grow is basically for themselves. No, they don't have cash crops, right? But what they grow is not even enough to support themselves. They don't even grow enough to be able to feed themselves. Right? So that's partly why, well, those are the main reasons why we work up there. Now, I'm back in Nepal. I've fulfilled my two original dreams and a series of other dreams that I've had since then, since leaving Nepal, all right? since coming to Grinnell, to uh, the U.S., to study but I still have dreams. I'm dreaming of the day when these kids, some of these kids that we work with, will also have the kind of experience that I had to see the world, to learn about the world, to meet the kind of people that I met. Right? And that's also partly why in addition to working with these students, these schools, I also go out and speak at schools, like I'm doing here now, to try to inspire youngsters like yourselves, right? To dream big, right? To dream of doing things that people around you don't dream about, don't think about, right? That the community that you live in doesn't think about, right? But of course, dreaming big and realizing it is not easy. It may seem that I have achieved my dreams without much effort, of course. But it wasn't easy. Of course, it was tough. Of course, I had to really keep at it, right? But when I felt, I, I mean, there were times, of course, when I felt maybe I won't achieve my dreams. Maybe I won't be able to get to the U.S. There were times, lots of times like that. But most of the time, I kept at it. Most of the time, I was very single-minded and focused, right? There were times, again, 
when I felt that maybe I wasn't good enough. But I kept at it. And I kept at it, and I hope those of you who are dreaming big, big will also keep at it. And I hope that you might lose anything, and I hope that you might lose everything, but I hope you don't lose hope. Right? And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. And if you need more information, there it is. Um, go, um, on Facebook, oh, you are young. I have some policies regarding Facebook friendship. Um, actually, this particular Facebook page is actually associated with my blog. So you can like that and follow that one. Okay? But not my personal profile. Okay? That you can... Yes. That's a, a page, so you can follow that because it, it's associated with my blog, so it's mostly stuff to do with my blog. But my personal one, um, I don't befriend individuals younger than 17 years old. It's a policy of mine. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher, so... <laughs> yeah. I don't befriend... I've never befriended my own students, and I... Yeah. When they leave school and go on to college, then I befriend them. Okay. Yes. When they get to college. But this particular page is a pay, it's a page. It's a community page. So if you like it, then you can follow what I post there. But that, again, is more to do with work. All right? Yeah. So you can like that and follow the posts on that. Right. Questions? How much time do we have?